take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 1. I have a confession and an apology to make. My confession is this. I wish that I would have preached this sermon series when I was 34 instead of 64. And for that, I apologize. But I believe God gives us opportunities to make every wrong right. And that's what I'm trusting him for in these six sermons to come. is for him to give me an opportunity to make that wrong right. This is more than a sermon series. It's more than a campaign. Because as you have noticed all over the church, you find these beautiful pictures. It simply says serving together. And that's that's the name of our series. It's the name of our campaign. But it's more than a series. It's more than a campaign. It's a burden. And I want you to think about that. The Bible has a lot to say about itself. The scripture says that the Bible is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The Bible says this about itself, that it shall never return void. The Bible says this about itself, that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And the Word says this about itself, that it's a two-edged sword. So I think for the most part we're all familiar about these wonderful things that the Bible says about itself. But then the word says this about itself. As it goes forth, some of the word will fall by the wayside. Some of it will fall on stony ground. Some of it will fall among the thorns but some of it will fall upon the good ground. And so my question today is this, what condition is your heart? What condition is your heart in for the word to fall upon? Think about that. And so I ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27. And in this sermon series, in this campaign, and in this great burden of my heart, today's message is entitled Serving Together. And I want you to see this in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together or serving together for the faith of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you today realizing that there is no other name whereby we must all be saved. And we realize that there is power in the name of Jesus that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And so we come to you today, O God in heaven, as we have spent so much time in preparation of this series and as we have fallen under the burden of what you have laid upon our hearts, I pray today that the seed will fall on good ground because it affects us all. I pray, Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would give us unction and liberty and power and clarity and boldness. And I do pray, O oh God, that if there is anyone under the sound of my voice who does not know you as their personal Savior, that they would trust you today. And as always, O oh God, help us not to traffic in the errors of untruth. And we promise to give you the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, the world is doing everything it can to tear down the fundamentals of our faith. Everything. Full throttle down, full speed ahead. And as a whole, the world that we know today, the world that we live in today, the world hates the church with a passion. They hate biblical preaching. They hate conservative convictions. They hate preachers who preach the gospel. They hate local churches who are walking in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we cannot ignore the fact that there is an elevated aggression against the fact that we are Christians. And because of that, because we call ourselves Christians, by the way, the word Christian is only mentioned three times in the word. The disciples were first called Christians in a place called Antioch. Every so often, we need to remind ourselves who we are, why we are here, and what we need to be doing. And the spiritual truths that we need to hold on to because the world is trying to do everything that it can to conform us into their carnalities and to their immoralities. I heard somebody say this today on national television that if Jesus Christ were alive today, he would be a groomer and he would be woke. God have mercy. Let me tell you what the word says about being conformed to the world. Because I promise you this, we're not here on this planet as a born again believer to blend in. In fact, the word says this in Romans chapter 12 and verse number two, and be not conformed. Don't do it. Don't bow. Don't bend. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove, demonstrate, exhibit, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I say this, and this series is not revolving around the ecclesia, the called out assembly, if you will, Universally, this series for the next six weeks is talking about the ecclesia or the body of Christ of Buford Road Baptist Church. Buford Road. And I want you to think about this. Because God has called us as Buford Road Baptist Church. He has called us. He's called the church. Yes. He's called the body of Christ. Yes. But listen. He has called us to do some important, very important things together. 
None of what he has called us to do is a solo act. Can, can somebody say amen? Listen carefully. God at Buford Road Baptist Church, he is not looking for, he is not looking through the thickets for Moses. He's not looking in the thickets for an Elijah. He's not looking in the thickets for John Wayne or Rambo. Contrary to that, and contrary to what the world thinks overall, listen carefully, the ministry of Buford Road Baptist Church, and I'm so thankful that we have people that take care of the lawn. We'll talk about that in the series to come. But God, listen now, we're not here. We're not here as Buford Road Baptist Church to provide curb appeal to the neighborhood. We're not here to provide a social hour to fellowship a couple of times a week. And I want to remind all of us today that there is a holy divine reason purpose of why we assemble as Buford Road Baptist Church, why we assemble, there's a reason why we assemble as the body of Christ right here. And we cannot do what we are supposed to do unless we are making disciples. Now, I want you to think about that. In fact, that's why Jesus gave the Great Commission. You know, you know what the Great Commission is? Now, I want you to think about it. It wasn't the Great Suggestion. It was the Great Commission. And this is what it says in Matthew 28, verse 18 and 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And this is what the Savior said. Let's, we know that he gave this to the world, but let's, Let's draw this down to Buford Road Baptist Church this morning. He said this, Buford Road. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Somebody say amen. And so from these verses right here, the Lord has much more in mind for Buford Road Baptist Church than for several or some or all of us to simply call ourselves Christians. Now, without question, he came for us. He came for us to receive him as our personal savior. There is no question about that. John chapter 3, verse 7, the scripture says, Marvel not that I say unto you or thee, he said, ye must be born again. In Acts 4, 12, he said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So first and foremost, the Lord came to give us everlasting life. He came to be our Savior, our propitiation for our sins, our Redeemer, our Atoner. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the word says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. It's not God's will that anybody dies and goes to hell. But that not just some, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart desire, the heartbeat of God. But never was it in his plan to be confined just to his heart that we just simply become content. Listen, church. It was never in his heart for us simply to be content with just being saved. Even though that's first and foremost, that's why he came. You see, the Lord Jesus did something with grace. 
And he wants us to do something with grace as well. And the Lord demonstrated grace on the cross. And the Lord Jesus wants us to demonstrate grace through servanthood. Can somebody say, oh, me, oh, my, or amen? Some people have no idea what servanthood is. I mean, listen carefully. Serving the Lord as a Christian is about demonstrating a practical love for Jesus and other people as well. Godly serving comes with a greater purpose than gaining for ourselves. As a follower of Jesus, listen carefully, we need to know that serving is not about ourselves. In fact, it's about dying to ourselves. It's all about Jesus and being like him. So let me explain to you right off the bat this morning what exactly is a servant of the Lord. Number one, if you're following along in your bulletin, it's found in John 13, verses 1 through 5. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel. Listen, we're talking about Jesus taken a towel. This is not Peter taking up a fishing pole. This is about Jesus taking up a towel. And the word says, and he girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, try to embrace this today, if you will, for a moment, because this was a huge object lesson. Jesus was teaching the importance of serving. I want you to see this again in verse number four and five. Notice these details. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girdeth himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. The Son of God. Now, Jesus didn't tell Peter to do this. He didn't say, Peter, get a bowl, get a towel, get some water, and wash these guys' feet. That's not what he said. And he didn't tell John to do it either. He did all of these details. He did all of these things by himself. I want you to see something with me in Philippians chapter 2, and I want to read verses 1 through 8. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 8. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves." Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the, also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, look at this, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I wonder how many of us get this. You, 
you get the scene, you get the idea, you get what Jesus did. And so Jesus, I believe in this passage, he wants us to get the big picture of what Christianity and what discipleship is really all about. And that is this. Yes, indeed. We do have the responsibility to fulfill the words of Jesus in Matthew 28. We have the responsibility to tell others of his amazing saving grace. Every one of us should be a soul winner. But secondly, we need to let others see the humility in our lives. We need to let others see the servanthood in our lives because when they see that, they will see Jesus. Jesus knew that actions spoke louder than words. And believe me, people all around you know the same thing. In Matthew 20, verse 28, the word says this, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Look at that carefully. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, but to serve. And to minister means to serve. Jesus always had the habit of giving us beautiful illustrations when he spoke. For example, he spoke of the vine. He spoke of the branches. He spoke of the fig tree. He spoke of the bread. He spoke of the door. Many times when Jesus spoke, he gave us visible object lessons. And they were always edifying and challenging. They were beautiful typologies. And the truth of the matter is this. Jesus always lived his life as an example. But this thing of serving did have an element of heartbreak to it even in Jesus' day, because the Bible says this in Luke chapter 10, verse number 2. The scripture says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And so at some point in our Christian life, think about this. How long have you been saved? How long have you known the Lord? At some point in our Christian life, we have got to realize that we have been made in the express image of God. And because of that, we need to strive to live like him. The uncomfortable truth about this subject is that many believers resist this particular teaching of Jesus. We can resist it but none of us can deny it. The truth of the matter is, when you think about this message of Scripture, it's our responsibility as Christians, as believers, to serve the Savior and to serve the church. Because when we serve the church, we are actually doing what the Word says, serving others together. But let us be real about this this morning because I do not think that it's a secret. Most of the time, most of the time there's always just a handful of people doing everything. A handful. Let me say this. And I want you to know, and not from a braggadocious standpoint at all, God knows my heart. But me, I'm not above doing any job around here. In fact, if you've named it, I've done it. I, I'm not above. In fact, I did this recently. I'm not above going to the restroom and finding it overflowing, stopped up and plugged up with everything you can possibly imagine and me grabbing a plunger and working it out myself. You say, you did that? Yes, I did. Is it the first time I've done it? Absolutely not. From, I can remember the days when there was no Steve Carter. Cutting the grass all by myself, trimming, taking the trash out, painting walls, coming in here on Friday nights, cleaning up. I, if I've drove in the van. I've kept the nursery. I've worked the youth group. I've, 
any job, any job that you wish to describe, I've done every single one of them. Not speaking braggadociously, but I have never asked anybody to do one thing that I have not done myself. But the biblical truth is this. It takes more than a handful of people to facilitate this ministry. And just so you'll know, there are openings everywhere. I want you to see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so this subject, serving together, it affects every single one of us. Jesus never said, well said, my good and faithful servant. He said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So serving is how we become more Christ-like, and no one can do everything, but listen carefully, all of us can do something. Well, pastor, <clears throat> I have absolutely no clue what I could do. I, I'm not very important. I don't, I don't know what I could do. I mean, I have issues. Well, there are three characters in the Bible that had issues. I want you to see this in Luke chapter 14, verse number 16. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. Oh, and they all with one consent, all. It's like Simon Peter said, I'll never forsake you. I'll go to jail for you. I'll never deny you, Lord. And when they took Jesus out of Gethsemane, all of them fled. All, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first one said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and therefore, I cannot come. I cannot come. I can't. Well, you know, there are certain songs of the church we love. We love Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We like on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. We like sometimes, Lord, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I think somebody needs to write a song with the title, I Can't Because... Now, I've given you the title. You put some lyrics to it. I can't because. Like the, these three individuals here, you look at this. Lord, I can't. I got a dog. I, I, can't, I can't possibly serve you. I live too far away. My kids are in sports on Sundays. I can't wake up early. I have bunions on my feet. I, I'm not that spiritual. And you know I got this wife. But listen, honestly, seriously, listen. We're not asking people to climb telephone poles and to run power cables in the ground, climb trees and trim them. Let me just give you something very simple to think about. Have you ever wondered the whole time Maybe some of you, maybe there's one or two of you have, but have you ever, 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 ever wondered how those blue envelopes got in your pew rack? Have you ever wondered that? Because I can tell you, there's, we don't believe in the tooth fairy. Tooth Fairy didn't come in here and put those envelopes. You know who put those envelopes in there? Most of them that are sitting in these pews right now. My dad put those in there. So you see, well, Pastor, you're saying this is so easy. I mean, but let me tell you this. 
if somebody's already doing 10 things and somebody said, I'll put the blue envelopes in the pew. You see how easy that gets and how it's one less job for somebody else to do. You think about this just for a minute. There's a gospel track rack out there. Somebody needs to take on the ministry of making sure that's full. The door's painted, flowers placed into positions, and there are openings in children's ministry and the choir ministry and people that can just walk around and pray ministry and maybe drive a van ministry. At some point in our Christian life, we have got to start doing what Jesus asked us to do. And listen carefully. I believe this as a church. We will all be better together. Number two, we were not designed to all do the same thing. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, the word says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We, we have to acknowledge diversity. We have to acknowledge that. When we serve, when we serve the Lord, number three, I want you to know that we are growing in grace. And that's what the Savior wants of us. He wants us to grow in grace. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. Again, the word says this, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so if you really want to please the Lord, please him. Pour yourself in his work and begin to serve. Because when you serve him, you will then begin to serve others. And number four, when you serve, you help build the unity of the church. There's a wonderful verse in Psalms 133, verse number one, and it says this, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And in Acts chapter 2, verse number 42, the word says this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, every man as he had need. And they continuing daily, look at this, this is talking about unity with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And because of this unity, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so I want to tell you this, that unity is essential for what we're doing in the body of Christ. Ecclesiastes Chapter 4, verse 12 says this, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, I know that the proper context of this passage is talking about God, the groom, and the bride. We get that. But an applied truth here in this context is that there are strengths in numbers. And so listen carefully. No matter what season of life that you're in, it, does, it doesn't matter because the truth is there's not one person in here, not one, regardless of the age, regardless of your health, regardless of what it is that you're going through, there is not one person in here who cannot pray. We can all do something, every one of us, and so number five, and I close with this, I want you to ask yourself the question, Lord, I have the idea of what this series is about now. I understand that the pastor is preaching the word. 
I understand that some of it is going to fall on the thorns, on stony ground. Some of it's going to fall by the wayside, and I understand that some of it's going to fall on good ground. Lord, let my heart be receptive to the word falling on the good ground. Ask yourself the question, Lord, what will you have me to do? In Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 6, and Saul get breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said unto him, look at this, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Listen carefully. This did not happen after he spent three years in the Arabian desert with Jesus. This didn't happen after he spent some time with Barnabas and Luke and John Mark. This didn't happen when he took his three missionary journeys. This happened the very moment he got saved, he got converted. He looked up and he said, okay, Lord, now tell me, what is it that you want me to do? I guarantee you that the Lord has not kept his silence from any of you. The day you got saved, the day God gave you a purpose, a plan, a reason for being on this earth. Listen, God in his omniscience, all knowing, he knows, he knew that there would be a day that you would trust him as your personal savior. You are not an accident. You are here for a reason and a purpose. God has a plan for all of us. And that plan, listen, hasn't started to evolve 15, 20 years after you've been saved, the very moment you gave your heart to Christ, the Lord said, okay, trust me, I will save you. You trusted him, he saved you. And God says, now let's get busy. So what will you do? Now I've got something that I want to give everybody this morning. And we're going to take our time to make sure everybody gets one. I have a very special. I'm going to show you what it is. Because everybody's going to get one. I want everybody to keep this in the margin of your Bible throughout the series. It's called Serving Together. Now listen, you pray about it. You ask the Lord the same thing Paul asked the Lord. Lord, what would I have me to do? Again, I'm not asking anybody to climb a telephone pole. On the back of this card, there are multiple things that we need some people to do in order that some of the people that are doing five and ten things already do not have to do. Is that reasonable? In Romans chapter 12, the word says this. Be not conformed to the world. We've read that scripture. But then it goes on to say, which is your reasonable service? Now, if you cannot sing, and you and the Lord know the truth of the matter, <laughs> I'm not asking you to stand behind the pulpit and sing a special on Sunday morning. You say, well, preacher, what, what, if my, what if my heart was just burnt? What if I've been praying and fasting about that and, and I just want to do it? If you've been fasting and praying about that and you want to do it, I'm going to let you do it. But anybody can get up here and make a joyful noise. 
So if you've wondered about, Lord, what, what can I, listen, God, God has not called any of us just to be saved and satisfied. None of us. There's always somebody that can put a blue envelope in the pew, that can put a gospel track in the rack. There's always somebody that can stand in the vestibule. Margaret's husband just died, Brother Bud. And you know what title I gave him many years ago? We talked about that at his funeral. We called him Mr. Sunshine. And the reason why we called him Mr. Sunshine, because that's what he was. He was a bouquet of sunshine. Every time somebody walked in the door, there he was. He was on spot, on cue at the moment. He was shaking their hands, giving them a smile, giving them a hug. And we started calling him Mr. Sunshine. In fact, we got him a little badge that said Mr. Sunshine on it. Anybody can say good morning and God bless you. Anybody can put a blue envelope here. Anybody can put a track in the track rack. Anybody can do anything on this list. You know why? Because I don't believe anybody's going to sign up for anything that's unreasonable. Unreasonable. The, lo the word says, which is your reasonable service. Not unreasonable. So this is what we you never, we've never done this before. Again, I wish that I preached it when I was 34, not 64. I'm 64, Michael. You can't believe it and I can't believe it. <laughs> but here's what I want to do, fellas. I want you to help me. Give one to everybody. Everybody gets one to you. Pass them out, if you will. And on the back of here now, you say, Preacher, this, this, this series, I don't know if I'm coming back to hear any more of that. <laughs> believe me, I get it. I got it when, when the Lord gave me the first one. But I tell you this, God hasn't saved us to sit in the pew and be satisfied. God has called us to serve him and to make disciples. We've just completed a brand new discipleship book. It's called Growth Tracks. And I'll be telling you about that in this series. On the back here, when you get this card, and you look at these things, if there's something on here that, that we've not mentioned, that we've not listed, and you say, well, yeah, I would like to do something. I would like to serve the Lord. Why wouldn't I? I'm saved. He's given me a home in heaven. He's given me everlasting life. He died on the cross for me. He was brutalized for me. He was spit upon. He was rejected. He's the most hated individual in the world now. He was then. Why wouldn't I want to serve him? Now, if you see something, if you know something on your heart that's not on this card, then you, you put down something else. You say, what I've got in mind ain't on a list. But this is what God's burdened me about. Now, here's what we're going to do. At the end of the series, not today, there's six sermons. There are five more, and I got to preach a Mother's Day sermon in between, but I will get to it. Then we're going to take these up because I want you to pray. This is your prayer card. This is a prayer card. That's all I want you to do is pray about it. If you, if you can be saved and satisfied with doing nothing, and you and God work that out at the judgment seat. But if the Lord has burdened your heart to do something, shake a hand, pray, make a phone call, send a card, whisper encouragement. I don't know, but let us know because this way we don't have to give somebody doing 10 things another thing. There's a lot to say about that in this series coming up. There's strength in numbers. Now, here's what I want you to know, because I want our church to grow. But how can we grow if we don't have people behind the scenes working the growth? Are you, are you, are you listening to what I'm saying? We have to have workers, disciples to grow. Now, there's one important thing that I don't know is growth track on here. 
All right, so she says yes, and I don't know where, but she knows everything. She knows it all. So I don't know, but she knows. Where's it at? Church ministries. All right, let's find church ministry. All right, you're right. You're never wrong. She's never wrong, folks. She's always right. I'm serious. <laughs> when in doubt about anything, you ask her. <laughs> Under church ministries, you'll find in this category, it says growth track. Now, I don't know who, the, because this person doesn't exist yet. But growth track is a discipleship program of our church, brand new brand spanking new. It's sort of like a church member 101. And it's been written, I have developed it with uh, experience in other places. And here's the thing. Growth Track is 101. It's a discipleship program for new members that come into our church. Because here's the thing. If we are not making disciples... And we cannot fulfill the Great Commission. The only way we can feel, fulfill the Great Commission is to make disciples. And we, we, in 2022, uh, latter part of 21, 22, there was over 60 people that walked this out and joined the church. But here's the thing. If they are not discipled, they don't know what's expected of them. They don't know who we are, what I preach. You've heard me preach long enough to know that I preach the truth, the word of the God. And here's the thing. There, there might be something that I say or you feel that's a little different here and there. But listen, we will never disagree on the gospel. Never. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important than the gospel. We preach the gospel. So here's the thing. I want you to look at this. And I want you to keep it in your Bible. And I want you to pray over it every day. For the next now five weeks to come. With the exception of Mother's Day. And I want you to look at this. For surely there's a work. That all of us can do. Ask God. Lord. How can I be strengthened the numbers? You say, well, I'm, I'm too old. No, you're not. If you believe the word of God, in the Old Testament, there was a man named Caleb. Caleb, do you know what he did when he was 80 years old and plus? He said, I want that mountain. He said, I want that mountain. And it took every, every fiber of his soul to do it. But his heart was in the right place. So it doesn't matter what season of life we're in. We understand that there are crises. We understand that there are surgeries. We understand that there are difficulties. We understand that there are infirmities. But again, I come back to this to say that all of us, no matter what season of life we're in, can pray. And I ask you this question. Is there any greater resource that we have as believers on this earth than the power of prayer? All of us can pray. So as our musicians are here, keep this in your Bible. Pray over these things because at the end of the series, we're going to take these up. And I pray. You see, why I wish I preached this when I was 34. I pray that in my prime right now, that I will see this church begin to flourish and grow, that where we will see not only souls saved, but we will see this church making disciples, and we will see people that are doing five and ten things already will have a help here and a help there and a help there to where their strength in numbers and our church is becoming vibrant and healthy and growing to please the Lord. We can do this. Let's bow our heads in prayer.